Well, good morning, everyone. Um, happy Tuesday and welcome to the second event in our ABNY boardroom breakfast uh, series. This is a special series created for the ABNY YP Associates, um, where we hear from our esteemed board members and foundation trustees, and you kind of get to a peek behind the curtain of, of uh, the ABNY world. Um, Today, we are so lucky to have Julio Peterson, Vice President Real Estate at the Schubert Organization. Um, as a reminder, um, when you come in, please rename yourself. We encourage you to stay on camera for this meeting as well um, and put any questions you have for Mr. Peterson in the chat. Um, we will do a live moderated Q&A at the end. Um, so just ping me um, if you want to ask a question and we'll make sure to call on you. Um, we're so excited to have Mr. Peterson today and Peter Barra, Blackie Steering Committee member to moderate the conversation. Um, as always, please spread the ABNY word about um, YP Associates, but also just ABNY in general on social media at a better NY. Um, and with that, I will pass it off to Peter. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Excellent. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, so as Sarah said, my name is Peter Borak, and I am a senior associate in the real estate department at Paul Weiss, and I am on the YP steering committee. And we are so excited today to um, have our second event in the boardroom breakfast series with Julio Peterson, who is the vice president of real estate at the Schubert organization. And obviously, I think everyone here knows what Schubert is, uh, but just a little bit of background. Schubert owns and operates a number of Broadway and off-Broadway theaters. And currently, they are uh, presenting shows such as Come From Away, Dear Evan Hansen, Chicago, and Phantom of the Opera. Uh, side note, I'm very excited to do this today, particularly. Uh, my wife has actually seen Come From Away tomorrow, so it works out perfectly, and she's, I think, joining us today. So um, in his role as Vice President of Real Estate, Mr. Peterson is responsible for Schubert's overall management of the organization's corporate real estate. So that includes aspects such as disposing of transferable development rights, uh, office and retail leasing transactions, and the company's outdoor signage business. And he also oversaw the development of the Little Schubert Theater on 42nd Street. And although I've not actually worked with Julio, uh, Paul Weiss is proud to call him a longstanding client. And in addition to his real estate work, he also is responsible for corporate and public relations and government affairs for Schubert. So in this regard, he works with city agencies on zoning issues and quality of life matters impacting the theater district. And although he's been at Schubert for over 20 years before that, he was a senior consultant in KPMG's real estate consulting division. And he was also a director of the Neighborhood Builders Program at the New York City Partnership. And before that, he worked at EDC, where he was responsible for managing projects such as the 125th Street Pathmark Supercenter, the Columbia University Biotech Research Park, the Malcolm X Memorial at the Audubon Ballroom, and the Julia de Burgoso Latino Cultural Center in East Harlem. So he has a wide um, breadth of experience. Uh, Mr. Peterson is a native New Yorker. He was raised on the Upper West Side and attended New York City Public Schools before going to Philip Exeter Academy. He went to Cornell University's College of Architecture, Art and Planning, and the Harvard University uh, Graduate School of Design, where he was actually awarded the John L. Loeb Fellowship. So we are really lucky to have Julio with us today, and hopefully everyone can give him a warm avenue welcome. So Julio, welcome uh, to the second in this series. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, you can just call me Julio. I don't, Mr. Peterson, I used to be a young professional back in the day, um, but now I'm 55, so I guess I'm not. I don't make the young cut anymore. Um, so um, I'm really happy to be here and really excited to see younger generation of, uh, of uh, Abneyites uh, come into the fold. Uh, I've been at Abney for 11 years. So I, I guess when I started, I was a young professional. I'm not sure, but um, so thank you very much for having me today. And Peter, thank you and, and your firm, Paul Weiss. They do great work. We've been working with them for over 20 years. And um, so just thank everybody for allowing me to be here today. Absolutely. So Julio, you have such an interesting job and I, I'm curious, how, how did you get there? Maybe you wanna talk a little bit about your career trajectory because just reading your biography, you obviously have an interesting job now, but you've also had some other interesting positions. So maybe you wanna talk us through a little bit um, where you are and, and how you ended up there. 
Sure. So um, I, as, as Peter mentioned, I'm born, raised New Yorker. I'm like as New York as it gets. Um, I wanted to be mayor of New York. That was my dream uh, growing up. I no longer have that dream. Um, I worked for the city um, at the Economic Development Corporation. Uh, I came out of Cornell in 1990, and that's right, right when Mayor Dinkins uh, was, uh, was mayor um, through a very close friend of Abney, uh, Carl Weisbrod, um, who was, grew up with a mentor of mine who helped send me to boarding school. Um, I was able to get in at EDC. I studied urban planning. It was a great entree. Um, sort of did all the community development projects that some of Peter mentioned. And what I realized there is that I really didn't have the uh, patience or the diplomatic skills to be mayor, uh, quite frankly. Um, I'm more of a like tough guy, let's go do it. I'm not always as diplomatic as people would want me to be. So I realized that I probably wasn't cut out for politics. Um, so um, after that, I went to work with Kathy Wild doing uh, um, home ownership projects on distressed, in distressed neighborhoods in vacant city owned land in East Harlem, Harlem, Bed-Stuy, where we build um, what we call partnership homes to allow lower income or moderate income folks to buy their own homes. Um, these properties, these developments were subsidized whereby the city provided the land. Um, and that was basically the equity to the project and worked with a lot of um, community development banks and smaller developers to build these homes. So that was really exciting. Um, and then I had the opportunity to attend Harvard for grad school. So, um, and it was on scholarship, so I couldn't pass that up. And um, and I was sort of wanting to make money after Harvard. And so after working in, in government and not for profit, I said, all right, let me do the corporate thing. And I went to work at KPMG, um, primarily working on commercial mortgage backed securities, which um, basically um, banks and financial institutions take billions of dollars of mortgages and basically sell them off as bonds and get them off their books. And um, it kind of led to part of our uh, financial collapse. Uh, Peter probably can speak more about that than I can. Um, and I hated the job. It was, I was just like crunching numbers behind a computer. Um, I'm more of a person that likes to interact with individuals and so forth. So um, I wanted to leave that and I actually found an opportunity um, at Schubert, they were looking for a project manager to help them build this theater on 42nd Street, our first off-Broadway theater, and then um, and also sell our air rights. We're the one of the largest owner of air rights in Times Square and work on some other projects. So I applied for the job and I got it. I did get, I, I, at KPMG was my first $100,000 job. I called my mother. I was like, mom, I'm getting paid a hundred thousand dollars for a kid like me who we were squatters in vacant city owned building in the early seventies uh, where it was so bad that even our toilet water froze um, and it was rat infested and all kinds of things. So for me to get a, a you know, hundred thousand dollars, I felt like I was stealing the money. I couldn't even believe it. So um, my mother, uh, she was old. She, she didn't know what to say. I was at that time making probably like four or five times what my mother was making. And um, I took a pay cut to come to Schubert because I just didn't like the, the, the other job. It wasn't really cut out for me. So I've been here uh, 22 years. I've been promoted throughout um, the time that I've been here. And, you know, I just find it a great opportunity to not just work with an organization that's really vital to the culture and essence of New York City, but also the uniqueness of my job where I can sort of negotiate very complicated air rights transactions, um, deal, use sort of 
some of the political capital and my understanding of working with city government after working at the Economic Development Corporation and the New York City Partnership. And then also, you know, sort of get to go to the theater, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and being involved with civic and really great organizations such as ABNY who really want to uplift uh, the city of New York. So I, I felt that was an opportunity I couldn't really miss. And I and Schubert has been around for over a hundred years um, and is very respected institution uh, in New York. So I felt that, you know, for a New York City kid to come and work at an organization like this, you know, it would be really good for me. That's great. Um, Julie, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about your career trajectory within Schubert? So you joined as a project manager um, yeah. and, and now, you know, you, you've moved up. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that journey is like and, and, and um, what steps you've taken within the organization itself? Surely. So at first I started, um, look, I'm just going to, Schubert is never, I'm the first Black or Latino executive in the 100 year history of the Schubert organization, which people are like surprised, but I don't know that they should be that surprised because uh, it is what it is. Um, so um, I started slowly, um, the, the uh, previous chairman who passed away, Jerry Schoenfeld, um, we had a really interesting relationship. He was like the, the chairman of Broadway. When he would come in the room, people would just bow. And um, we both, uh, grew up on the Upper West Side, interestingly enough, at, at different eras, um, and we we just really connected. Um, he really um, enjoyed the fact that I, as I say, kept it real with him, even though I was, you know, very uh, junior, so to speak. I wasn't even an officer of the company at the time, but he respected that. And as a person of color, there have been issues. I'm just gonna, you know. I've been called arrogant and uppity and all of these other things, which I'm kind of used to. Um, so it doesn't really bother me, but I think, you know, you always have, to, I've always had to prove myself above and beyond. Um, and, and, but to me, I sort of, I'm always motivated by that because I like to prove people wrong and, um, and just also prove it to myself that I can do it especially when, when folks sort of put limits on individuals, whether you're a woman or a person of color or whatever, I think you have to persevere. And I've always been about that and always encouraging folks. So I've had to prove myself every step of the way. And I think, you know, the, the, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, the number of transactions that I've been involved with, the amount of revenue that I've helped generate for the organization, the ability to be able to navigate through city bureaucracies and understand how power works in New York City and relationships and, and, and that it also in order to the benefit of the Schubert organization. Over time, I was able, it took a while, but I was able to, uh, to get where I am now. Um, and so that was my trajectory, but I think that just being able to, to execute transactions and be respected by folks in the industry um, is really helped me. So really, um, you, you've been called some awful things, you know, you know, according to yourself, um, and, and you've had to outwork other people and outperform um, your own expectations. What's the secret to your success? What would you say to someone, you know, to a young Julio I'm um, just joining Schubert and saying, make sure you do this. I think you all, you have, one, you have to be prepared. I think two, I, I never let anybody sort of hold me back. In fact, those things motivate me. Um, so, you know, whether it was growing up as a kid who was asthmatic and couldn't really run as fast as some of the other kids, I had to figure out a way to sort of stand out. So that was academically. And then um, then later on, I sort of challenged myself physically and, you know, was involved, was on the basketball team and the football team. So I just always felt like use things um, to motivate you to do better as opposed to sort of just one being a whiner or being down on yourself. 
just like go out there and get it. And so um, to a lot of young um, to be young folks that I speak to, um, in, in addition to a lot of young black males, frankly, um, I just tell them, look, you know, people, there's going to be all kinds of haters and people are going to say certain things, but you can't let that keep you back. You got to keep pushing and try to, you know, have, try to read a lot, try to study and just never give up. So that's really what I, I, I say to people. And I use, you know, whatever negativity, I use that as a positive uh, to move me forward. That's great. So Julio, in your role today, what type of projects are you working? You've talked about um, certain types of real estate transactions, but what, what's a typical day like? What, what are you working on every day? Wow. Okay. So I'll, I'll give you an example. My, it's such a unique job. So um, whether it be selling, you know, air rights, which we can sort of speak about what that is a little bit, um, because to a lot of people, it sounds theoretical and and so forth, but it actually, it's basically like selling land in the air. Um, Peter knows a lot about that, I'm sure. Um, so a typical day, like right before during COVID, um, when we were trying to reopen the theaters and we figured out what our protocols were gonna be as it relates to, you know, how many times cast was gonna be tested and employees and all the workers in the theater. I mean, it took, it was a lot of work by a lot of people in the industry. But one of my roles was um, I had to find COVID testing locations in one month um, throughout the Times Square district where all of our theater workers who were required to be tested three times a week could go get tested. So I had to scrap, but I know every piece of real estate in Times Square and the landlords so I would see free, you know, vacant retail space or office space and I'd make calls. I'm like, hey, you wanna make $5,000 a month? You wanna help Broadway? And so I had to find these testing locations um, from 42nd Street all the way up to 50th Street where all these thousands of theater workers can get tested three times a week. And that was very challenging, um, but we were able to do it. Um, so that was sort of like one random situation, but because of COVID, but for example, right now I'm working on a transaction with Paul Weiss, Peter's uh, law firm, where are selling air rights to a development site so they can build a super tall hotel. Um, and then a lot of it was we have uh, tenants, uh, commercial tenants, restaurant tenants, like Sardi's restaurant is our tenant the Applebee's on 50th Street and Broadway and a lot of other tenants that we have. Um, when we sell air rights, um, we do these things that are called 1031 exchanges. Mm -hmm. And there, this is a, what, when you sell property, you can buy like kind property within 180 days and that have to, and you can defer capital gains taxes. Again, this is another way of rich people getting richer, but it's America. So, um, we purchased a lot of um, what we call single tenant triple net properties with stand along McDonald's and Chase Banks and all kinds of properties. So during COVID, I had to restructure a lot of leases with different tenants who were closed down restaurants and so forth, like a restaurant like Sardi's that really relies on the theater crowd. Um, you know, they had a very difficult time. So we had to restructure these leases make sure that they, you know, could, you know, survive. So when we reopened up, um, when things opened up again, they'd be okay. We couldn't charge them the same rent. So we had to structure rents, you know, basically provide some um, rent abatements, defer payments over time. And so every transaction was different. So uh, working with a lot of leasing attorneys, um, all kinds of attorneys, a lot of attorneys, a lot of attorneys. and. The attorneys always make money in the good times and the bad times. Right, Peter? No, no comment, um, but just keep, keep the clock running. Um, so Julio, you, you touched on a lot of topics that I want to dig into a little further, but I, I want to ask one more broad general question. What, what's the most challenging part of your job? You're working on so many different things. I, I didn't realize the extent of the, the landlord aspect of Schubert's organization. So there's that, there's transferring development rights, there's dealing with the city. What, what's the most challenging part of your job right now? 
would say dealing with the city, uh, <laughs> frankly, with city government. Um, and that's why I thank Abney and the folks there and, and also at, uh, at uh, the Broadway Association, um, which is another sort of a, a business entity that helps promote uh, Times Square. I think dealing with city bureaucracies is just so complicated. There's so many people in these agencies that have been there forever. And the culture of these agencies and these individuals, um, you know, I respect what they do, but sometimes they get caught up in their own head and they don't see what's going on in the outside world. I'll give you an example. Um, we're currently doing this transaction where we're selling these air rights, and these are what are called floatable air rights, where we can take development rights from one block. Only the theaters can do this and landmark buildings in certain areas and sort of float them to non-contiguous streets. So as part of that, the city um, charges us uh, what's called a, a floating air rights fee, it goes to, to the theater sub-district council. So a portion of the proceeds that we generate go into this pot, and then those revenues are, are granted to not-for-profit arts organizations throughout the city. So it's sort of like spreading the wealth. So the fee that we had was about 18 bucks a square foot. And so I contact the city and I let them know that we're gonna be doing this transaction after we've been closed for 18 months. The longest that the theater has been, the Broadway theaters have been closed forever. Like you can put the Spanish flu there, the world wars, 9-11, all of that. And so we contact the city and let them know that we're going to be doing this transaction and that we would like for it to, you know, just give them the heads up so we can do this in a timely manner. The first thing I hear from the city is that we're going to increase the fee. Now, we've been closed for 18 months. The city, you know, the restaurants rely on the theaters, the parking garages, the hotels. So as opposed to saying to us, um, we would like to be helpful to the theater and the street, and we're going to move this transaction along, they said that we're going to increase your fee. And so it's like, and this is just one instance, but we have these situations all the time uh, with different agencies. So it's really working with the agencies, uh, the, 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 the fortunate part is that I can contact City Hall and sort of say, look, you know, we have this bigger issue here. Um, the theater's being closed. We're trying to reopen. Is this what really should be doing to support the theater at this very critical time, increasing the fee? So sometimes they're in their own bubble and they don't really see the bigger picture. So I, I think making the city agencies more efficient more business friendly, not just to big, bigger businesses, but to smaller businesses too. So that's the difficult part dealing with, with, with city government. That can be very frustrating. So Julio, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about the theater subdistrict fund and, and sort of how that operated. I think we've covered that. And I, I do wanna dig into that a little bit further though, because it's a really interesting program that I think has helped Broadway survive for not just since the pandemic for, for a long time. And one of the questions that I have is other than reducing the fee payable into the fund, would you have any other policy suggestions to help make that program more beneficial to the theater owners, to, to Broadway? Sure. Um, there's a provision in the zoning text where if you substantially rehabilitate, it's a one-time uh, bonus. It's a, a theater rehabilitation bonus. And in one of the things that happened just historically, it, the Broadway theaters are not the highest and best use of real estate. So if you wanted to make the most money on a piece of land that a Broadway theater is located on, you'd probably knock it down and build a big tower on that. So theaters were being demolished a while back when Times Square was really bad. And in order to preserve the Broadway theater industry, the city imposed um, landmarking the theaters 
as historic structures. And also I'm limiting what could be presented on that property to limiting it to presenting what's called legitimate theatrical attractions. So that sort of encumbers the space, the building for only one use. So as a, in a capitalist society, you want to be able to maximize the value of your real estate and we're not able to do that. So in order to compensate the theater owners for that, they allowed us to sell these unused development rights that we could have used on those parcels and sell them within the theater subdistrict council district. So one of the policies that was instituted was a one shot floor area bonus for the rehabilitation of substantial rehabilitation of Broadway theater. So that meant making real improvements. So it's very hard to utilize that bonus um, because it's hard to, you could only use those development rights that are bonus on that, on that block. And if you've gone through Times Square, you can see that there's not that many development sites next to the theaters. So the ability to allow that bonusable floor area to float within the theater district and not just be on that block would be a very good policy decision that could help the theaters. It also helps the city because then it incentivizes the theater owners to really make big investments into the infrastructure of the theaters. And it's a lot of money. We just finished going through a ULERP, the Uniform Land Use Review Process, which I do not wish on anybody here to have to go through. Except I don't know. the lawyers that help you with that. Correct? Except the lawyers who make a lot of money helping you go through it. Um, <laughs> thank you, Peter. Um, so <laughs> we went through that and it was just so complicated that the developers don't even want to go through it. And the amount of revenue that you generate by selling the air rights you basically have to use to improve the theater. So it's not an economic boom to the theater owners. You're basically reinvesting those revenues to do the work that you committed that you were gonna do. That's really interesting. Julio, I, I have a follow-up there. So for that one shot rehabilitation uh, floor area bonus, does, this, what, does the city earn the $18 put per foot on the transfer? No, because those are, those, you have to put the proceeds into doing the uh, improvements to the theater. Understood. It's the other transfers do not require any improvements to the theaters. However, you have to commit that in perpetuity, this building will always be a theater and that you will maintain it to a level that you, you know, basically committed to. Interesting. So, so Julio, you talked a little bit about trying to get the city to to change that aspect of the um, of the development rights program, and obviously we are in the first few months of a new mayoral administration and a new city council. What other policy objectives would, are on the top of your list that you 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 know if you had the opportunity to to get a bill in front of the council and on the mayor's desk, what what would that bill include? I don't know that it's a policy objective, but I mean, there's just, the city is, I'm a big fan of New York City. And to see some of the conditions that I'm seeing now in the city is just mind boggling. It reminds me of when I was growing up in the seventies where it was really bad. And so I, think that we have to put real, real, real dollars behind mental health. Um, I mean, obviously security and, and safety, I mean, that's a given, but I think the mental health issues and, and the folks that you're seeing on the streets out here, they need help. And so the police department can't deal with them. That's not their expertise. We need to figure out how to help these individuals and so I think it's really about a, a, a financial commitment, not just the public sector, but the private sector. You see a lot of, you know, real estate folks and, you know, big CEOs, you know, sort of 
you know, I'm not going to say complaining, but, you know, having issues with what's going on with, with things on the street, maybe we should put our money where our mouths are and help fund real health, mental health um, programs to, to help these folks, but also help the quality of life around the city. One, the garbage, the sanitation department, I don't know what is going on there. Um, I think we need to make real changes in what happened, garbage pickups. What time are the pickups done? Are there any containers that we can put garbage in so there's not rats running around all over the place? I mean, like real quality of life issues and not just on the Upper East Side and Upper West Side in Manhattan, but in other parts of the city. I have people, you know, I have a lot of family in, in Harlem, in the Bronx. It's really bad. And so we have to make real commitments to, to, to mental health, and cleaning up the streets. I mean, I like to travel a lot and I've gone to a lot of cities and I this is the dirtiest city. I mean, it's not good. I'm pretty straight shooter, so I just- I appreciate it. No, hopefully uh, everyone listening today, we can, we can make those changes. I, I wanna shift gears slightly and talk about COVID. Um, it's hard to think of, a, of an industry that was as impacted as Broadway was, I mean, just totally shut down for 18 months. So a couple of questions. One is hindsight is obviously always 2020, but what do you think is one area where Broadway shined during COVID and was successful in handling um, the pandemic as it came up? And conversely, what do you think is one area where maybe not Schubert, but Broadway in general could have maybe done a, a little bit of a better job? Well, I think that we did a great job and really illustrating how important our industry is. Um, because prior to COVID, I think people took Broadway for granted. It's like, oh, we're gonna go to the theater. It's really great. And you know, you pay whatever, 200 bucks a ticket and people are complaining about that. And, you know, but the theaters are doing really well. And, and so that was fantastic. Um, just let me say the city, of New York does not provide the theaters with any tax subsidies, like they do sports teams. We're the number one tourist attraction to the city of New York. Everybody that comes to New York, I would say 90% of the people who come to New York, they wanna see a Broadway show, right? So the, we were always taken for granted, no, ta no subsidies, no tax breaks, nothing. We paid full, real estate taxes and all other taxes. And we're a super larger employee of folks, not only in Manhattan, but throughout the entire city. We have you know, stagehands, ushers, all kinds of crews that work in our theaters and they live throughout the city. So by us being able to show the impact, the economic impact that the theaters have in Times Square and then how it reverberates throughout the city. People jumped on that bandwagon. Um, a lot of hotel owners then realized the importance of the theaters. The city understood the importance of the theater. The governors understood the importance of the theater. Charles Schumer and the states and the senators and, and Washington DC understood the importance of the theaters. So us to be able to galvanize the people in our ecosystem and being able to, to, to really point out that we're a vital part of the economy and the, and the life of New York City um, was really fantastic how we did that. Um, I think uh, with regards to where we failed um, as a result of George Floyd, and all the Black Lives Matter, I don't like to categorize it as just being Black Lives Matter because it's a bigger than that. It's bigger than just a little BLM thing. Um, well, everybody wanted to be, you know, do the right Black thing, right? So um, they put up a lot of broad, Black productions on Broadway, right? Now, we put all these Black productions on Broadway 
at a time where people were not going to the theaters yet, right? Then there's no there wasn't any coordination with the number of black productions. So it's like they were destined to fail. And so it, to me, I look at it as, you know, we need to be coordinate that in a real way, right? Um, a lot of shows that are sort of about black folk, um, you know, they don't always attract the number of patrons that other shows do. And so the fact that everybody wanted to roll out a black show in the middle of when the pandemic wasn't done, it sort of, to me, I thought that was a bad strategy. We should have done it in a, in a more sort of graduated way um, as opposed to just throwing them all out there and then they don't make any money and people can say, oh, well, we tried black shows. See, they didn't, weren't successful. So that part of it didn't sit right with me. I don't, I'm not involved with that aspect of the business. So, but I would have definitely made my opinion known. So you, you, one of the things you just mentioned was we weren't, the pandemic wasn't done yet when, when that was happening. And I think in the past couple of weeks, there's been a little bit of a, a shift in thinking about the pandemic ending and whether or not it will ever end. Um, and people seem to be taking a, a new way of thinking, new approach of this may, this may be with us, COVID may be with us forever. And obviously no one has a crystal ball, but I'm curious, Julio, from where you sit, how, how does Broadway start to transition to, quote, living with, with COVID? Um, and and what, what does that look like in, in a short-term basis and in a long-term basis? What, what changes do you think Broadway will have as a result of the pandemic? I, you know, I, I look at it the same way as people going back to offices. Like, I'm a big believer people should be at work. Like, like you know, sometimes I like to stay in my house, you know, but I like to be at work. And so I, we were taking all of the, all of the, you know, precautionary actions, you know, the people wear the mask and, and we have the, the HEPA filtration systems in our air conditioning system, um, um, infrastructure. Um, I really think that people just need to go out. And so I'm not one of those type of people that wants to, you know, that I'm going to change my life that much. Like I had COVID. Thank God we're still here. It's gonna be with us. Like we gotta grind through it. And so I just think that that attitude needs to be, you know, we need to let people know we just gotta come to the theater, you gotta come to the jobs if, if you to work. And that's really how I feel about it. I think the industry is coming to that realization that it's gonna be here in some form or whatever. And we just people have to wear their mask and try to be safe and try to be vaccinated. So we we've actually been very cautious because of the way we're enclosed our spaces are enclosed people are next to each other but you know folks who are at the super bowl and folks who are the you know the next games and the next games and they're screaming and they're not wearing masks so if people can do that part of our issue is that we have an older population of folks that have been coming to the theater and they're a little bit more sense, you know, nervous about that. And it's understandable. Um, so if we can make them feel comfortable, I think little by little there, I can see sort of an older population coming back to the theater, which is really good. So I don't know if I answered your question, but that was my answer. No, I think that was helpful. Let me, let me ask, when do you think audience members will, will be maskless at shows? I mean, there's been some news recently about ending mask mandates, but if you had a crystal ball. I don't know. I mean, we're just trying to be cautious and have people wear the mask. I think that's the right thing to do now. And so we kind of like see what happens a little bit more because when Omicron hit, you know, we were coming back and then that hit. And so I just think we just got to, be cautious, but not scared all the time. So I, I think that's sort of the what we're going to follow for a while. Obviously, we we consult with you know the health authorities. You know, listen to what the governor has to say and this you know city health commissioner and you know all the other folks that are, are a lot more uh, have the expertise in that space. 
we, we, in fact, the Broadway League has its own epidemiologist that works with us and gives us, you know, guidance in that regard. Understood. So, Julio, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we actually have a couple questions from the audience. And I just want to talk a little bit about your involvement with ABNY. And do you maybe want to describe for us how you first got involved and, and what you do with and for ABNY? I probably need to do more, <laughs> but um, the uh, I actually got involved. It's a very small world. Um, I was a delivery boy on the Upper West Side at a pharmacy when I was a kid, and um, Jack Rudin, um, one of the Rudin older Rudins who helped found Abney. I was the delivery boy, and um, so. Um, one day, um, later on, when I was at Schubert, we were negotiating, um, a lease with the Rudin family and, uh, building that they own on our land. So I also negotiate ground leases and, um, I was brand new to, pretty new to Schubert. And, you know, I met Jack Rudin was still alive and he kind of remembered me and, um, after that, uh, Bill Rudin and Eric Rudin were there and with my two bosses. And I sort of became, when they realized what, when Jack Rudin realized I was the delivery boy, um, for, we kind of had that rapport. And then I was sort of the point person on the Rudin relationship. And as that, those relationships started to, you know, flourish, um, Bill Rudin asked me to be on, on the ABNY board, and I understood the importance of ABNY because growing up in the 70s when we had the fiscal crisis, New York City was really bad. And um, it was organizations such as ABNY, I mean, instrumental in bringing together not just the business community, but other players in New York City life, bringing them together to figure out how do we make the city better? So as a Mr. New York, that I love New York so much, I just felt like when, when Bill Rudin asked me to participate, that I should participate. And I also felt like as an Afro-Latino from the city um, who probably didn't have, who grew up a little bit different than other members of ABNY, um, I could bring a different perspective to ABNY um, so, you know, I really appreciate what ABNY does in bringing together really smart people, people who really care about the city to make the city better. So um, that's, you know, that's why I've been with ABNY for 11, 11 years. And it's also very helpful um, because it, being a part of ABNY, you also get to sort of meet folks who you know are very important to New York City in a lot of different ways. So not only has it benefit, you know, we I hope that as an admin member, I add value and that representing the Schubert organization um, in this space because there weren't a lot of arts organizations or in our industry was not really part of ABNY. And now I think people, as I said earlier, understand the importance of the theater and the arts in our not just from a cultural perspective, but from purely economic and hiring perspective. The arts employ a lot of people. And so that's how I got in the mix. And, you know, I'm very happy to be an uh, ABNY board member. And I know ABNY is very happy to have you. Broadway is a huge positive externality on the city. And so it's important that, that it is represented. Let, let me ask you this quick, one quick follow-up question to that. In addition to serving on ABNY's board, what other boards or are you, I, I know you are involved on the board. So do you maybe want to talk about what other boards you're involved in and, and how that works with, um, with ABNY and how you, how you allocate your time? So I, um, I'm a lot of boards. <laughs> I'm on the board of, well, I'm the co-chair of the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Center at the Audubon Ballroom where he was assassinated. Um, so I'm co-chair of that with Malcolm X's daughter, Eliasa Shabazz. I'm on the board of the Public Theater. Um, we're going to be doing a big project, which is redoing the Bella Court Theater in Central Park. So I'm on the executive committee. Um, 
and the committee that's going to be overseeing the redevelopment, the the, the rehab of, of the Delacorte Theater. I'm on the board of the Broadway Association, the Board of Governors of the Broadway League, which is the umbrella organization for all of Broadway, the Times Square Alliance, which is the business improvement district for Times Square, um, drops the ball at New Year's. Um, I'm on Camp Ramapo for Children Board. Uh, uh, Repertorio Español Board. I'm on the board of the my boarding schools alumni association, the Exeter Alumni Association. I'm on a lot of boards, but I I need to get on a paying board. <laughs> uh, but I'm on a lot of not for profit boards. I just thank God because I have a really great life, so I always like to give back. That's great. Um, so we, we do have a couple questions from, from Abney members, and first I'm going to turn to Steph Campagna Wheaton, who actually works for the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, so hopefully she can take some of your suggestions to heart. I love the Mayor's, ma that's the one agency there, thank you. I wish all the I, agencies were like the Mayor's <laughs> Office of Media and Entertainment. I'm so glad to hear that, Mr. Peters, and I will definitely pass that along to Commissioner Del Facilio. Um, I was taking notes on just a few of the things you mentioned, and I was hoping to skate by without you finding out I work for a city agency. <laughs> um, but well, thank you so for much the, for your support. For a great one. That's, that's what we strive for here. And of course, the arts are so important and so thrilled that you're joining us during Broadway week. I hope everyone is buying tickets. It's extended till February 27th, two for one deals. Please make sure that you are um, supporting Broadway in that way. Just had to plug that in for work. Um, but. Um, Mr. Peterson, it's so wonderful. Like I, um, like you said, my name is Stephanie Campagna Wheaton, and it's always so wonderful to see fellow Latinos in these spaces. And for so long, Broadway and the arts have truly benefited from the talent creativity of Black and Brown folks. But like you mentioned, a lot of the time, they're not in the decision-making spaces, like uh, putting Black performances during a time of a pandemic just to set them up to fail. But um, so obviously, not enough black and brown people are in these spaces of decision-making capacity. How do we get more black, brown, Asian folks into these decision-making arenas or, or behind the house roles? Yes, as I um, said to a very powerful person on Broadway, I said, black people and Latino people can do more, a lot more than tap dance and sing. And so, um, the whole ecosystem of Broadway. Look, the American theater is a white institution. It was created by white people. It's for white people. It was, that's the essence of it, right? So the ecosystem of it, whether it be the ownership of the theaters, the producers, the lighting designers, the composers, the stage hands, all of the jobs, the PR folks, the lawyers, that entire ecosystem is primarily white, like 99.99%. .99%. And the jobs that we have are either on the stage or sort of the lower level jobs, cleaning the theaters and being an usher or being a security person. I think the way it needs to happen is by really having an investment in, in nurturing folks kind of your ages and younger to get them in there. Like there's a lot of DEI trainings that are happening. There's all this stuff and you know, that's great. But I don't think it's gonna change a lot of people's attitudes. Um, and it's not gonna change the structure of these businesses. The only way that it could change is by organically having folks get the opportunity and the skill set to be in these different positions and grow. Like I came in as a project manager. I'm not saying that I'm, you know, fantastic or anything, but you know, be able to grow within that industry and prove yourself as opposed to sort of just saying, you know, oh, we're gonna have tons of black productions or we want to change the mind of a lot of, you know, older 
you know, people who've been in these industries by having them go to DEI training. If you pulled all that money that's being used for DEI training and created real um, job training and, and opportunities for people of color to get in the unions, like stagehands unions and all these other type of unions that have been um, not allowed people of color to get in, then that's how we work it. It's not going to happen from some, you know, having three productions of color and one Latina one and one Native American one and one that has, you know, all of them mixed up um, and having a white play with three black people in it. That's not how it's going to happen. And so like one of the things that I pushed for, um, which was considered symbolic, but I'm getting is I want to have two theaters, uh, have the Schubert organization name a theater after somebody black, right? So uh, we're going to get a theater named after somebody black. Now that may not mean a lot, but to a young black kid who, or Latino kid, you know, like, oh, wow, that's named after, you know, blah, blah, blah. The August Wilson Theater, which was the only theater named after somebody black, that hadn't had a black production in it. So I, I like, you know, for us to deal with it organically, but also there's symbols, right? Like, one of the things I hated the most was uh, going by the Museum of Natural History and seeing the statue of Theodore Roosevelt with a Native American and an African standing by him. And so, you know, me and a lot of other folks, you know, we complained. And that I drove by it today and that statue is not there anymore. So. Awesome. Yes, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, a hundred percent. And thank you so much for your work and you know standing up for folks, even in uh, especially with symbolic gestures, they mean so much. And I hope to see you around Broadway. Absolutely, I hope you do. Guys, do come. Excellent. Um, I think Caroline Engel has a question as well. Yes. Um, hi, uh, Mr. Peterson. I'm Caroline Engel from Nicholas and Lens Communications. Um, thank you so much uh, for your time today and all this insight you've been sharing with us. Um, I have two questions for you. I'll start with kind of a more fun one. Um, I'm also a believer of we need to get out and do the most essential NYC things like go to Broadway to bring the city back. Um, so that being said, I'm looking for my next Broadway show to go to. So um, what is your recommendation? What's your favorite Broadway show right now? Whoa, um, we, you know, let me just say this. A couple of them have closed. You know, we had, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird uh, and so forth and so on. We just opened up Music Man with, with Hugh Jackman and that was very good. Um, I think right now, and we closed and, and um, the, the uh, Temptation play was closed. That was very good. Um, right now, I'm not, I would say right now, I would go see probably the Music Man. We have Macbeth coming, which is going to be pretty hot. Um, I, I think also that you know, I always loved Hamilton. So people are gonna go see that all the time, but we have some other things in the pipeline. So I can't announce anything, but we have some funky stuff. I have not seen my, um, Michael Jordan musical yet, which I heard was very good. So you may wanna check that out as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll definitely keep an eye out for the upcoming shows. Um, my second question is, uh, do you work with the signs in Times Square and kind of what does that, what does that entail and what does that look like? The signage? Yes. Yeah, so um, I actually created um, our Schubert Outdoor Signage Company. Um, we're, we had all these walls and things next to our theaters and I would walk around and I said, well, why are we putting billboards on there? So they're like, all right, well, see what you can do. So anyway, um, we, um, the signage industry is complicated because it, it, the way 
real estate owners are taxed on signage is, is a little bit complicated and I don't think it's very fair to the real estate owners. Um, the signage has been doing really good, thank God. Um, and the signage companies have been very helpful to not only the theaters, but the entire sort of Times Square um, to, you know, send images and signs about Broadway coming back in the city. So I think the signage industry is very important. Um, and it also allows opportunities to have alternative revenue sources, right? So if you're a little not-for-profit theater, not just for the big boys, but or people, sorry, um, not just for the bigger companies, but if you're a small not-for-profit theater and you have a wall and you could, you know, get signage there and generate alternative revenue sources, I think I always look at that as an opportunity to help um, smaller entities as well. So I think the signage industry has been very good for the city. Sometimes there's areas that maybe you don't need signage. I think there needs to, that needs to be looked at as well. Great, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Excellent. Well, I, I do know that the time is 11. Um, and so Julio, I just wanna thank you for joining us for today. I think really um, interesting conversation. Great to hear from you on a lot of wide ranging topics. Um, and I did not know that there was going to be a Michael Jordan musical. And so, um, no, Jackson. Michael Jackson. Ah, okay. Sorry. I was thinking, I was watching the Nick game last night. They lost again. Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, heavy, yeah. uh, and Understood. Policy decision. Can we, can we get, we need a basketball team in New York? How about that? <laughs> we have two basketball teams in New York. <laughs> a good basketball team. <laughs> Oh, I, oh, wait, I think there's an MSG person here. I'm sorry. Carl is like, she hears it all the time. She hears it from me. <laughs> I, I, I've, said I it, I, I've said it to Dolan himself. Yeah, I think you did tell me that too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Excellent. Thank you well, so much. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Peter. And thank you, Julia. This was wonderful. And we are so, so lucky to have you on our board. So thanks everyone for coming and I hope you have a great Tuesday. Thank you very much. Thank you.